I've had a lot of sporting experience in the background and if you're playing a match and they start playing the man rather than the ball, mm. you know they're in trouble. Yeah. And that's what they were doing. They mm. were playing the man, they weren't playing the ball. They were getting diverted away from what the central issue was, was their opposition to repeal. Hello and welcome to Girls With Goals. I'm Neve Marr. I'm joined on the show today by Peter Boylan, former master of the National Maternity Hospital. Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. So, In the Shadow of the Eighth is the book that you have written. Yeah. Um, it's out now. It details your 40 years working uh, for women's health in Ireland. I think, starting off, I think it's fair to say that a lot of people outside of the medical community um, and, and probably our audience as well know you from the work that you did around repealing the Eighth Amendment. Right. Um, but the book in itself goes back into your yeah, past yeah. quite a bit and um, your early career in medicine as well. And, and I really kind yeah. of enjoyed that aspect yeah. of it because it was something that I hadn't seen, obviously, on, on yeah. TV. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, why did you choose to write the book in the first place, I guess? Well, uh, I've had a long career. Yes. Uh, I'm retired now since the end of 2016 and I've been involved in a lot of different things and a lot of people said to me, you've got to write it all down, you've got to tell your story. So I eventually said, OK, I will. And um, I'd written a piece for a publication called The Angle, mm -hmm. which is a local publication in aid of the Peter McVeary Trust out of Renla, where I live. And uh, at the launch of that, then um, I was just talking to some people and then I was contacted or got in contact with Penguin mm. and they offered then to publish the book. So we had various meetings about the structure of the book mm. and then I put my head down and started writing. Yeah. Uh, virtually not quite seven days a week but an awful lot of hours uh, from the beginning of the year and I had a fantastic editor with Patricia Devey in, in Penguin and the process was fascinating for me because I would write and send it in and then it would get edited and bits changed around, bits taken out. And they really did, I think, did a phenomenal job and I managed mean, to tell the story. That's, I was going to say, a daunting experience because your career has been so long and I hope that's not an mm. offensive thing to say, that's just no, years. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. also, I mean, in terms of your early career and kind of even going into obstetrics first, that yeah. kind of decision for you, you, you kind of explained that, mm. you know, dabbling in other kind of fields, surgery and stuff like that, you didn't get to deal with the patients as much. Yeah, so was it an was, easy decision? Yeah, well, when I was a medical student, um, one of the things, we rotate through all the different specialties, yeah. surgery, medicine, psychiatry and paediatrics and, and obstetrics. Yeah. And we did, I did eight weeks in Hollow Street as a medical student. And one of the things that the professor who was doctor at the time, Kieran O'Driscoll, mm. did was to get us to sit with um, six women having their first babies throughout their labour. So from the time they came into the labour ward until they delivered their baby. And we would talk to them. And the main purpose of the exercise was not to sort of say what their blood pressure was like, how many stitches they needed or yeah. any of that sort of medical stuff and not to give our impression of what the labour was like, um, but to try and get into the woman's head yeah. and understand what it was like for her to go through labour and to give birth. And that had a huge influence on me because it, it showed to me the the emotion involved mm. in, in giving birth and what a wonderful thing it is. Mm. And uh, the transformation from quite often extreme anxiety um, at the end of labour and will the baby be normal and then the baby's born and the transformation into utter joy mm. when the mother and the father see a happy baby, a healthy baby, emerge and put on the tummy and just the sense of awe. Yeah. Uh, and that to me, and then I found Hollow Street a very a lovely place. Um, everybody got on well together. There was very little, there was no sort of me, doctor, you, midwife sort of thing. Everybody worked together yeah. you know, for women's interests. And that had a, a big effect on me, and I really thought, I am really enjoying this. So when I qualified, I did my intern year in St. Vincent's Hospital, enjoyed that, but then um, said I'd, I'd go back to Hollow Street and see what it was like. So I was lucky enough to get a job as a senior house officer, and, and on it went from then. I just never looked back. It was great. I think what's 
an interesting aspect of the book and in, in general your career is the amount of change that we've seen in Ireland since yeah. you qualified. Like you said mm. there, I think it was 1974, am I correct, when you That's qualified? Right. Yeah. So I, one of the stats that kind of jumped out to me was that back then, you know, I think it was that only 11% of women giving birth were over 35 and now it's closer to 40%. That's so right. So yeah. the actual profession has mm. changed so much throughout your time and of course that yeah. lends itself to, you know, the career and the work that you did later on. Yeah, and changes happened in Irish society and were reflected through uh, women coming through and having their babies. Yeah. So what's happened over the course of my career is that there are more women having fewer babies. Mm -hmm. So most women will have two or three children. It's unusual to see four or five and six, seven, eight is really highly unusual nowadays. It wasn't that unusual when I was in my training in the early days of my career. Other things changed. The cesarean section rate was only around 4%, 4, 4, 4 to 5% when mm -hmm. I was training. It's now around 30%. It's much higher in, in different hospitals around the country, some of them as high as 38 40%. Yeah. Epidurals were virtually unknown. Uh, there were no epidurals. I find that so hard to believe. <laughs> I know. Ultrasound when it's absolute infancy, so you could see very little of the inside and in, into the uterus. Yeah. And now it's just phenomenal. I mean, it's almost like looking at a movie. Yeah. Uh, and that allowed, that development then allowed uh, the development of what's known as fetal medicine, where mm. you can treat the baby in the womb. So there's been absolutely, anesthesia has improved enormously. Um, but by the same token, it's got more complex because of older women. Uh, IVF pregnancies, for example, are often yeah. multiple pregnancies in older women. Incidence of diabetes, the incidence of obesity. Yeah. So all of these have, have kind of complicated the practice of obstetrics. But it's still incredibly rewarding. And the same process, the delivery of a healthy baby at the end of it all, is what the whole thing is all about. I mean, in terms of the, the legal aspect of 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 your profession and, you know, coming up a little bit more into um, repealing the Eighth Amendment and stuff. At what mm. point in your early career did you start to really, uh, I suppose, notice yeah. that there were these massive implications for you as a doctor in terms of the legal ramifications of the law of the land mm. and also being in a profession that you, could you see that this was definitely going to have to change at some point? I did, yes, but my, my first exposure to termination of pregnancy was when I went to London to continue my training at Queen Charlotte's and the Chelsea Hospital for right. Women in, in the middle of London. And I became very friendly with another trainee um, who was from a Jewish background. And he did a lot of the terminations or was involved very much in the terminations for fetal abnormality, mm. which was completely new to me because yeah. uh, it just didn't happen in Ireland. Yeah. A, we didn't diagnose them, and B, of course, it was completely illegal, so it was just never never discussed. Mm. So um, I had long discussions with him and, and began to see the reasonableness of the whole approach. Mm. And uh, there was a lot of other early terminations done in the Chelsea Hospital for whom I worked. Coming from Ireland, they just said, look, I presume you don't do any of these. Yeah. And I had never trained in them or anything like that. But that was my first exposure to it. Right. And then I came back to Ireland and I was an assistant master in Honor Street. And uh, at that time still, ultrasound was fairly basic. Mm. Women seeking early terminations never went to the maternity hospitals. So we didn't encounter them. Okay. And I was an assistant master in 1983 when the referendum, the 8th, was going on. Yeah. Uh, it passed me by completely. As in you just, you weren't aware? We worked just ridiculous hours. So yeah. for example, um, a weekend on duty would start on a Friday morning at the end of a busy week. Yeah. And we'd go home having been in the hospital all weekend on Monday afternoon. Yeah. You'd have Monday night off and you might be on duty again on Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. So what went on outside the hospital was really So news kind of and everything there. like that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Very we just, separate. Yeah. And because women weren't coming into the hospital looking for terminations, it was sort of kind of didn't involve us really. Yeah. And it, it wasn't to bring termination into Ireland. It was just to sort of, and the word copper fasten we used a lot yeah. in that debate. It was just to copper fasten the existing situation. Right. So it didn't really impact me. And then I went to work in the States uh, when I finished my training. There were no jobs in Ireland and I wanted to work in the States for a while anyway. Yeah. So I went to a job at the University of Texas in Houston. And the reason I went there is because there was a new chairman coming from San Francisco who was a world expert in premature birth. And 
there's a lot of the, the American academic scene is very dynamic yeah. and they change a lot all the time. So when a new chairman comes in, they tend to kind of turn things upside down, kind of not revolutionize is the wrong word, but they it sort of put their own imprint on the department. Mm. So I was interested to see what it would be like to work with a, a new chairman because at the back of my hand, of my head, I had kind of the idea I'd like to be master of Hollow Street at one time, and that right. was sort of my long-term ambition. Yeah. So I wanted to see what it was like to, uh, you know, to be involved in, in change and how mm. you how you did that, how you brought people with you, mm -hmm. and um, so there, you know, Texas was kind of funny because um, the Texan law is is quite restrictive on abortion. Mm -hmm. And no abortions were done in the hospital. They're all done in clinics outside the hospital. Yeah. So again, I didn't have much exposure, but I did have a lot of discussions with the chairman and other members of the department, um, just about the whole question of, of ethics in, in reproductive medicine. And there were a lot of consultants in the hospital because of the American system, but some of them had admitting rights to a Catholic hospital. And rather than do straight sterilizations, what they called it was uterine isolation. Wow, okay. because they weren't allowed to do sterilizations, but they were doing them and they were calling it uterine isolation. Oh. Now, I kind of thought, come on, lads, that's a bit hypocritical. Yeah. But that was the way it was. And then when I thought about it, maybe that's what was going on in Ireland when people were prescribing the pill for uh, irregular periods. Yeah. And Irish women had the highest rate of irregular periods in the entire world because that was the only way you could legally pres prescribe the pill. Wow. So it was a very different country in the in the 70s 80s and yeah. it was only into the early 90s and then when I came back um, as a consultant back to to Dublin um, I was in charge of the I started the fetal medicine unit yeah. and uh, when I became master then one of the things I wanted to do was to liberalize both the epidural service which was pretty straightforward but also to liberalize the approach to um, female sterilization because there was a huge demand for it yeah and um, I ran into trouble there with the Archbishop. I was called up to his palace to, in Drumcondra and told basically, you can't be doing this. It's, it's not right. It's not medical procedure. And I said, look, I'm the doctor. It is. Mm. <laughs> and we had a discussion across the table, sort of a, an ocean of mutual incomprehension. Yeah. And I felt that the Archbishop and the Assistant Bishop were really looking at myself and the matron at the time as different species. It just, there was no understanding between us. Was that the first time that you kind of um, had the religious aspect come knocking on your door when it came to protocols that you were essentially yeah. bringing into place? It was, yeah, it was. And it was the first inkling that, to me, that um, Catholic ethos in reproductive, women's reproductive health could have an adverse effect on them. Yeah. And again, at the time in the 90s, abortion wasn't so much of an issue yeah. uh, in the country. The, the eighth was there um, and we were beginning to see the difficulties that it was causing. But it was a whole sort of attitude towards women and women's place in society and women's place in humanity mm. um, that was not well catered for by Catholic ethos when it came to reproductive health care. Yeah. And there's a long, long history behind that, obviously going back to the whole story of Adam and Eve. Mm. It's all Eve's fault. <laughs> Classic. Everything is Eve's fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's what underlines the basic misogyny that yeah. exists. And I mean, in terms of your colleagues, you know, within the profession, um, having been in the UK and being in America as well, coming back, I mean, it sounds as if your eyes were opened to the, the possibilities. Did you yeah. feel like your colleagues were open to that as well? Because, I mean, I'm presuming that in, in a in an industry like medicine, there are elderly doctors, there are young doctors, you know, yeah. I mean, was, was there a liberal vibe that was in any way showing its head in the 90s when it came to Well, you, ha you have to have a spread of, of yeah. age. It's no good having everybody being very old, course, everybody yes. young doesn't work like that, yeah. and, and that's not good. Mm. But uh, no, I mean, one of my assistant masters was Peter McParland, who's mm -hmm. a consultant now in Hollow Street, and he went to um, Toronto and fully trained up in fetal medicine and came back then. And I was doing all the fetal medicine at that time. But when Peter came back, I said, look, you, you, you take over this. Yeah. And he has transformed it and, and developed it. And it's now one of the largest fetal medicine centers in the country is in Hollow Street. And, you know, there's several consultants, whereas at the beginning it was just myself and then myself and him. And then we got more on board. So, um, yeah, the younger generation tend to be much more liberal. Mm. And I can see that now among the trainees and among the younger consultants. 
and they've grown up in a different Ireland from yeah. the Ireland I grew up in. They're much more liberal. They're more practical in terms of uh, understanding women's needs, really. Yeah. And just having a more tolerant attitude towards different different attitudes. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose in terms of kind of, you know, our audience here and, and when we really began to... to talk about these issues that women mm. were facing when it came to their healthcare would, would be Savita. And you dedicate, yeah. you know, a chapter to her that, that's named Savita. Two chapters. And then oh, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the one that's just Savita. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, of course, you know, the, the chapter that comes after that. And I suppose that was when it's a moment in our history that, you know, yeah. nobody is ever going to forget about. But it was, it was really a moment from kind of my generation of women that yeah. were, were really like, you know, how is this happening? How is this mm. what's happening in this country? And and who is to blame, I suppose? That's the thing, like, you know, the questions that, that came from, from such a case. And I remember when it broke, I remember the next morning reading about it in the paper and being totally confused, if I'm being completely honest, because sure. I just didn't understand. And this was, you know, historical. There were legacy mm. issues. Of course, the 8th had been there since 83. Yeah. So a lot of, I think, Mm. women of my age were really only opened up to such an issue yeah. when Savita passed away. And I mean, I suppose yeah. from your point of view, this had been something that you had been very aware of and had been yeah. working on for years. So yeah. did you know at the time, like, did, did you know that this was just going to be global news? I didn't realise it was going to be global news. I yeah. knew it was a big issue in Ireland. Yeah. Now, if you just take it back a little bit, there was the X case yes. and all of the other and alphabet That was in 92, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the government had set up an expert committee following a ruling by the um, European Court of Human Rights yeah. to look at the judgment of the X case and implement it because the... The, government, the politicians had done nothing about it at all. This was the case of the 14-year-old girl, yeah, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, who was raped by, yeah. by a neighbour. Now, um, so there was an expert committee set up under um, Sean Ryan, Justice Sean Ryan's mm. uh, chairmanship, and I was a member of that committee. Our report was given to the government the day before, the day before yeah. yeah, so the Just news of Savita's death. Complete coincidence, complete wasn't it? Complete coincidence. Yeah. Obviously, nobody knew about it. Yeah. Then it was obviously Savita's death was the impetus for the implementation of the Protection of Life and Pregnancy Act, mm. which followed on from the Oireachtas Committee hearings and so on. So that bit of legislation was put in. Mm. But that wasn't enough, actually, because it didn't go far enough. But what it did do was it showed that when abortion legislation was introduced in Ireland, the sky didn't fall in. Yeah. and women didn't abuse it. Mm. And there was a lot of scare stories about saying that well, women will feign suicide yeah. in order to get a termination of pregnancy, and that clearly didn't happen. Yeah. So, I mean, myself and a lot of other doctors were saying, look, you've got to trust women. Uh, they're not going to lie their way into getting an abortion. It's just not going to work like that. Yeah. And it didn't. So then uh, that sat in train then, the whole thing. Then we had Miss P. Yeah. Uh, which wasn't abortion, but it ha was about the Eighth Amendment. Yeah. The Eighth Amendment was responsible for Miss P and, and all that happened with her. And then we had uh, Miss Y, yeah. uh, the um, refugee who mm. was gang raped as a, a war crime, arrived here and found out that she was pregnant at eight, eight weeks. Yeah. She didn't. She became suicidal because she couldn't get an abortion. She was in direct provision, right, at, at the time, yeah, wasn't she? And she yeah. had even even the things, the details of that case that a lot of people not necessarily might know, but even the things like the costs of even filling out the form, the fact that she didn't even have English didn't to, speak English. to do that. Yeah. yeah. And because of the law, she would have to organise everything herself to travel abroad. Yeah. Uh, because under the law, we nobody could help her to do all that stuff. Yeah. So it's it so is a distressing absolute reading, horror story. Yeah. yeah. Absolute horror story. Mm. So. All of those things led into then the, a lot of pressure on the government and then we had the uh, Citizens' Assembly, which was a brilliant way of dealing with it because yeah. everybody from all points of view got an opportunity to put their point of view. And then we had their decisions, which surprised a lot of people with yeah. their apparently very liberal attitude. Mm -hmm. And then we had the Oireachtas hearings and then we had the uh, referendum about the 8th mm. that was successful and then we had the legislation yeah. which had to go through and then we had the deadline on the 1st of January mm. and the minister deserves a massive amount of credit for that mm -hmm. um, because he said we're going to do it and it was the only way to do it, otherwise yeah. we'd still be here talking about it. 
I know yeah. we we had uh, we had the minister on the show as well before um, mm. before the legislation came in, yeah. and we were discussing it, you know, and and he was he was committed to it. But I mean, it's funny because when we're talking about uh, the eighth, and when we're talking about all of those cases that happened, you know, you in particular were very much, you know, you were on the debates, you were you were yeah. out there, and you detailed this in the book. It was it was interesting because at times the story became about you, you know, and at yeah. times I mean in terms of perhaps a diversionary tactic by, you know, pro-life groups or, or whatever the case was, battle-weary is something that kind of springs <laughs> to mind when it comes to all of this. I mean, behind closed doors when you weren't on camera and when you weren't giving interviews mm. and stuff, like, what was that time like for you as somebody who was as, essentially expert opinion, but that was also being called into question a lot of the times, oh, the time, saying yeah, it was personal the, opinion. Yeah, there was all sorts of letters being written yeah. to the paper and written to me, uh, signed by different people. But, you know, I've had a lot of sporting experience in the background, and if you're playing a match and they start playing the man rather than the ball, mm. you know they're in trouble. Yeah. And that's what they were doing. They mm. were playing the man, they weren't playing the ball. They were kind of diverted away from what the central issue was, was their opposition to repeal the eighth. Yeah. And it ended up that they actually didn't have any really good arguments. Mm. Um, now, the religious point of view is very valid and people have that and they have to be respected and so on. But nobody has to go and have an abortion. Nobody has to perform an abortion. Mm. And so, you know, th their views need to be respected. But they also need to respect the views of the rest of the people who voted 66% of the population. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it didn't, to be honest with you, it didn't particularly bother me. Yeah. Uh, because I kind of felt, well, you know, you're losing if you're starting attacking me. Yeah. So I, I thought it was a good sign. Yeah, I mean, it's, fact, it's uh, a good way to look at it, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, um, I mean, a lot of the stuff that was said was, I mean, it was nonsense. Yeah. You know, so you just kind of say, look, get a life already. Yeah, and I mean, like, you know, you, you write in the book as well just about in terms of the tact that you kind of went about. It was it was mostly about um, medical fact, you know, as in you were, you were very much yeah. approaching it from the point of view of like, okay, well, you know, and some of the stuff that was coming out and like as a journalist even reporting on it, at times I was like, is that true? That can't be true. Is mm. this true? A, a lot of research trying to, to figure it out as well yeah. because, you know, the yeah, mud was slung, the, Oh, the mud, there was a lot of mud slung around. Yeah. And there were a lot of kind of a, uh, attempts to muddy the waters um, with mud. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one of the things was, was a failure to distinguish between screening and diagnosis. Mm. And this has particular resonance with um, people with Down syndrome. And um, it was put about that you could diagnose uh, genetic abnormalities through this screening test. Mm. But that's not true. Okay. And it has come out again now since the whole cervical check thing. And finally, it's acknowledged in the newspapers that actually screening is not diagnosis. Screening yeah. is screening. Yeah. And it has a failure rate. Mm. So if you, you don't make a decision in, in the context of screening for abnormality in pregnancy, you don't make a decision on the basis of a screening test. Yeah. You go on and you get a diagnostic test. What the screening test tells you is there's a high risk of something happening. But that risk is influenced by the age of the woman, by her body mass, mm. uh, by the gestation of the pregnancy and so on. So there's a lot of other influences. But people simplistically said, oh, you can get a blood test and it will tell you whether or not your baby has Down syndrome. Yeah. Wrong. Wrong. Inaccurate. But, but put out. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing in terms of a, a campaign that had such huge, you know, emotion as well as history yeah. attached to it. You know, th yeah. th these things did happen and it was... I mean, I think of the women who, like, I interviewed and, you know, people who shared their stories throughout. Mm. Um, yeah, it's very brave. Just very brave, very brave and, yeah. like, very... And I just, you painful. know, I couldn't... Yeah, exactly, very that's it. Very I mean, painful That took a huge emotional toll on, on some of the women coming forward and telling their stories. Yeah, they, the and, stories uh, needed to be told, but at the same time, I know, did. like, from a media point of view, there were times when I remember thinking, you know, at what point are we taking advantage in order to yeah. get these stories out there, you know? Yeah, I think, well, they were, having gone through it themselves, they saw the damage that it caused mm. and they could identify and empathise with the damage it was causing other women. Yeah. I can sympathise with it, but I can't actually empathise because I'm a man, I can never have a termination. Yeah. But I can certainly sympathise and understand uh, where they're coming from. But women and, and couples who've been through this had a much greater insight mm. than anybody else. And yeah. so their stories were hugely powerful. 
And, and this really was primarily, you know, it was a woman, woman run, women backed campaign, yeah. and uh, the, the Together for Yes group were just phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the group that formed the Together for Yes, they were just fantastic the way they did it. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, the National Maternity Hospital because I know yeah. that it's very important, and you dedicate is it five chapters? Am I five right chapters, to it? Yes. In the book, um, <laughs> yeah. so I mean, obviously very crucial. But first, I suppose you know, since the legislation has come in, um, I know that you're retired. But from a professional mm. standpoint, in terms of you know, doctors now, obviously, a very different world for them from from what was. Um, yeah. How do you think it's going? I mean, it seems like a. From the it seems like a point a, of view? I mean, I suppose because the thing is, it's, it is different from like, you know, other countries still in terms of that. It's 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 within our maternity services and hospitals, so you know, there's still demonstrators, there's GPs that have come out and, and spoke about things like there are still issues that are being. Uh, yeah, the service is working extremely well. Yeah. And one of the good things about it is that it's embedded in the health service, yes. so it's not done sort of in private clinics, private clinics mm -hmm. and, it, and that should not happen. Yeah. So nobody knows whether a woman going in to see a GP is going in for a prescription or because she's got a cold or a yes. sore leg yeah. or because she's pregnant and is looking for a termination of pregnancy. Yeah. So that, that is a huge advance. Uh, women don't feel guilty. Doctors don't feel guilty. They don't feel like criminals in their own country. Yeah. The hospitals have stepped up to the mark extremely well, mm. those that are, that are involved in the service. And... Um, it has been challenging for a lot of people, mm. um, both morally and emotionally and, and so on. But they have stepped up to it. And the numbers in the hospitals are much less than was anticipated. Okay. So that has made it a lot easier for them to, to deal with it. And there's also a thing called values clarification education, which is where you look at, at different sort of scenarios, basically, yeah. and, and challenge yourself, how would I react? So, for example, somebody might be quite comfortable with, um, agreeing to a termination for a 12 year old who had been raped yeah. by somebody, you know, a neighbour or whatever. Whereas uh, they mightn't be so so comfortable with somebody who had got pregnant from a one night stand, yeah. you know, while they were away at some meeting or something like that. Mm. So all of these issues are explained or sort of explored. Yeah. But from the point of view of the National Maternity Hospital, um, there isn't a single hospital in the entire world built on land owned by any branch of the Catholic Church that can perform any of these procedures. And that includes uh, contraception, sterilization, IVF, gender reassignment surgery, or yeah. termination of pregnancy. So there isn't a single one in the entire yeah. world. So to think there was going to be one in Ireland, in Dublin, was really quite delusional. I mean, and the thing, I, I think on this, you know, it kind of, it started, I suppose, now correct me if I'm wrong, 2016, the, it started, the news broke um, ab about this. Well, the original, the original um, proposal was that the hospital would be co-located yes. uh, on the site of St. Vincent's, and that was all enthusiastically embraced by St. Vincent's. Then there was a change on their board, and there was a complete change in attitude. Yeah. And then there was also a change on our board, which kind of changed things as well. And it went from it being a standalone, uh, co-located, completely independent maternity hospital with all of the facilities of the general hospital available to where it was going to be owned, the hospital was going to be owned 100% by the Religious Sisters of Charity. Yeah. That was, that was the agreement. That was the, what was worked out under the Mulvey report and agreement between the, the two hospitals. Yeah. There was going to be a separate company set up to run the hospital, which was going to be owned by the Sisters of Charity. Right. There was what was known, there was some complicated Byzantine legal arrangement, which was never going to work. Mm. It was full of contradictions and challenges in, in the Mulvey uh, report. Uh, I raised the issue of uh, religious influence being a problem. Yeah. I was dismissed. I was told, no, the legal arrangement would protect it. I asked for an example of a single hospital in the entire world where this happens. Yeah. And I'm still waiting because there isn't one. And it was all about a year ago it was put about that, um, oh, the nuns are well out of, of St. Vincent's. They have nothing to do with it. And it was also put about that they would never wanted to run the hospital. I never said they would be running the hospital. It was yeah. owning the hospital and owning the land was the issue and owning the company that was running it. Yeah. The board structure was all wrong with the Vincent's domination and so on. Then, uh, just before the book was published, questions were put to the Sisters of Charity about, because it was in the book, yeah. uh, about whether or not they needed Vatican approval. And lo and behold, they do. Now, that was all kind of denied, if you like, right up until before the book was published. So, I mean, Do, I'm they, justifiably they, angry about were this. Were they <laughs> denying it 
I mean, were they denying it through knowledge or were they denying it because they believed that they did not need Vatican, or we don't know that? Look, Google, yeah. uh, if I find, can find it out, uh, the religious organisation should know this. Should know they this. Know, and it's, it's a process known as alienation, which yeah. basically transfer of property and so on. The not complicating factor is that the Bank of Ireland holds a, a mortgage over the entire property mm. and over all future assets yeah. on the site. So it's a very complicated uh, situation. But the ultimate problem is uh, that due diligence was not done by yeah. the people who were negotiating this deal, despite my saying, look, there is a religious problem here. Mm. And they said, no, no, you're talking nonsense. We've sorted it out. There's no issue here. And now there is an issue. So what we're faced with now is the Vatican are going to decide whether or not a new national maternity hospital is built in the Republic of Ireland on land. That That's sentence the in itself feels like, I mean, your book is called In the Shadow of the Eighth. It feels the celebrations when it happened and everything. It feels like we were stepping away and we were moving forward mm. in terms of women's rights, societal expectations. And then that one sentence that you just said feels like we're transferring back to the 70s. And I mean, that's kind mm. of a really shocking Further thing. Further back? 60s, 50s. 50s, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it seems Well, that's shocking. the situation all over the world. Yeah. I mean, canon law is a universal thing around the yeah. world. And canon law supersedes civil law. So, and there's all sorts of private property rights, which means that they can't do a, the government can't do a compulsory purchase order on the site. Yeah. I mean, you saw with Intel, they can't, by a farmer's land yeah, yeah. because of private property rights and so on. So uh, now if the Vatican says, yes, you can alienate this property into a civil structure, mm -hmm. a secular structure, which will allow the building of a hospital in which terminations of pregnancy, sterilizations, IVF will take place, mm. that would be world shattering news. Yeah. Uh, one can only hope that that will happen. We've been told that it's imminent. Now, mm. imminent to me means days rather than weeks and months. We were told that a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Uh, we were told that this process has been underway for years. Yeah. And we were told that it was with the charities regulator, then it wasn't, and then, you know. So there's a whole load of, we need, if we're going to believe this, mm. <laughs> when, when, if it happens, we're going to need credible documentary evidence yeah. seen by everybody that it is transferred into a secular structure which will allow the building of a maternity hospital in which all of these, what are described as immoral acts, are uh, performed. Because I saw, you know, um, Labour TD Alan Kelly was, was speaking there over mm. the last kind of a couple of weeks on it and, you know, he said something that was quite insightful. He was saying that, you know, the, the biggest loser in all of this is going to be the women of Absolutely. Ireland. Absolutely. And I mean, essentially, yeah. no, he didn't say this, but like once again, you know, here we go again. You yeah. said that, you know, regarding the, yeah. the Miss P case, you said, here we go again. I mean, yes. it feels yeah. to me like um, you couldn't have been the only person who was saying this and that was being wiped away. Like surely people can see the ramifications of what this might have. Well, if they saw them, they denied them. Right. And really, you know, I find it hard to believe that St. Vincent's didn't know about the whole alienation issue yeah. and didn't understand about the building on, on Catholic land. Mm. I find that hard to understand and I find it, quite frankly, hard to believe. Yeah. Hollow Street people didn't do due diligence, right. uh, the negotiating people, the chairman and the master in particular, who, mm. who led the whole negotiations. Kieran Mulvey, who was the mediator, um, should have realised maybe there is something in all this religious stuff yeah. and just done a quick Google mm. just you know, to see. and would have found out, yeah, this is a major issue. Yeah. And that should have been sorted out years ago. Instead of which, there's been millions spent on design fees. The amount of hours people have put in uh, in designing the whole thing is just unbelievable. Yeah. And now we have 43 million being spent on a car park and a pharmacy on the understanding that they are to be part of the new development of the National Maternity Hospital and some development in Vincent's as well. So it, this is a major scandal. Yeah, but uh, I mean, imminent, you know, you, you said that, so it, we but are- But the Vatican don't move fast. Yeah, you know? well, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely know that. Yeah. Um, but there, there is things that are going to be coming out in, in the coming days, hopefully coming days, weeks around this, and yeah. some resolve will come. This isn't, because I mean, this isn't going to roll for years. Surely it can't with that amount it of money. It can't go on forever. Yeah. And a, a crunch time may well be when it comes to making a decision as to whether to go to tender yeah. for the building, but that can't happen until everything is sorted out. Because right. otherwise there'll be 
more millions wasted. Yeah. And um, it has been said by people in the know from mm -hmm. the Vatican that uh, they wait until Dermot Martin retires. He's due to retire at the end of, or in the middle of April next yeah. year. They'll wait and see who the new Archbishop is, what their opinion is, and then the Vatican will make their decision in their own time. Uh, Dermot Martin wants to get out of hospitals. He's a man I've huge respect for. Mm. He's more interested in social justice and looking after the poor, the homeless, and so on, and yeah. the right sort of stuff. Uh, but we are where we are, and yeah. we are waiting for the Vatican. Yeah. Well, well I mean, I, I kind of, I want to end on on something positive because you know the book is it's it's. It's very upsetting at times, you know, like when I was yeah. reading it, there were things that I thought that I knew about that I really yeah. didn't. And it's, it's yeah. hard. But at the same time, you know, I think coming back to why you chose to go into obstetrics in the first place is because, mm. you know, you said that you felt privileged to be there yeah. when, you know, a woman gave birth. And I think yeah. that the work that you've done in your career is is pretty unbelievable in terms of the things that you've been faced with. And I also mm. think that it's it's something that people will benefit from reading it because I think people need to understand what's happening up until this very day a little bit more in the healthcare system. Do you know? Yeah, there's a lot of background in it and, yeah. and a lot of extra stuff, for example, on Savita that people who wouldn't have been aware of yes. the, the stresses, the, the conditions that the nurses were working and in. And the midwives. I mean, well, it, it just, appalling. it was Absolutely really, that, I was really shocked by that, by those, yeah. those two women that were on. One of them was heavily pregnant, heavily pregnant herself. Yeah. And the amount of cases, because of course, we swoop in on, on the things that are yes. splashed across the front paper page but like mm. at the same time there are often so many other factors that are happening yeah. behind the scenes and yeah, I'm glad look that at things in isolation. You know, I'm glad yeah. that you went into that detail as well because it's important mm. that that people know about that. It's important that the people understand the stresses those nurses were under and, yeah. and uh, you know that that absolves them of an awful lot of criticism that they have been subjected to quite unfairly. Is it a positive future for women when it comes to oh, healthcare yeah, I mean, in Ireland? I mean, uh, we've, yeah, it's, yeah, been, yeah. it's been, it's been, it's been, I mean, you can't even describe what it's been like in the past for some women and the things no, that they've I mean, had to go through. No, I mean, it is really hard to understand. Yeah. But no, I mean, the, the landscape has transformed. Mm. Uh, women now have the full range of reproductive health care available to, to them in this country. The one sort of thing that is bringing us, dragging us back, if you like, and opening our eyes is the whole situation around the move of the National Maternity Hospital to the Allen Park site. Yeah. That's the kind of uh, what a fly in the ointment. Yeah. But women's health care has been transformed over yeah. the last several years by the work of a huge number of people dedicated, you know, um, all sorts of people who've worked really hard for this. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I think it is of huge benefit to women and it's been a privilege to have been part of it. Absolutely. Well, Peter Boylan, congratulations on the book. And In the Shadow nice, of the Eighth is available and it's out now. So um, I do implore you to go and get a copy and read about it because it's very important for us and it's very important for our children and, and the future of Ireland as well. So thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah.